On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Larry Nespoli with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. At New Jersey's community colleges, we believe that our students, as well as all citizens, need to be informed about the important issues facing higher education. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking under the principle of stewardship, Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Tisch WNET studios right here in the heart of Lincoln Center, New York City. You do not have to be a Yankee fan. You do not have to be a baseball fan to appreciate our two guests and the work that they are doing right here on Broadway. Uh, Fran Kermser. And uh, Tony Pontura are the producers of the Bronx Bombers, playing at the Circle in the Square beginning in early 2014. Now, the Bronx Bombers, right? Yankee fan, right? But 1977, set 1977, little thing, let's say, between then manager Billy Martin and the shy and retiring Reggie Jackson. There you go. Right? But it doesn't have to be just for baseball fans, right? No, not at all. Set the scene. Why don't you set the scene? Well, in 1977, Reggie Jackson was pulled out of a game on national television. I saw that. And you saw it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Like everyone else, I saw that, right? Right. And so this kicks off the story where these gentlemen are trying to figure out how to work as a team. And the play goes from uh, Babe Ruth to Derek Jeter and looks intergenerationally at uh, all of these great players and really the individual versus the team. And it's so relevant to now, we're in such a you Inc. society. And how does that fit into working together as a team? Um, and that's really what the evening is about. So it's interesting because it isn't just about that period of time with the Yankees. It's about other people uh, and those of us who are uh, big Yankee fans, Neil Shapiro, who was just here earlier taping, uh, our president at WNT, huge Yankee fan. I know he's gonna like this play. We talk about this all the time. Back in the day in the 60s, there were people like Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, and others, Yogi Berra. But you go all the way back, you mentioned Babe Ruth. Lou Gehrig is in this. And I'm thinking, how do you put all these other Yankees together, and what does that have to do with the craziness of the late 1970s in the Yankees? What's the connection? Well, once you create that conflict, now Yogi Berra is totally, he's got a dilemma. By the way, you put Carmen Barry, Yankees, uh, Yogi's wife, in it. Well, you know, there's, you know, behind every great man, there's a great woman, or so they say, right? Yes. <laughs> so I think, but, uh, but, but, you know, so now Yogi's like, he, you know, he has ten championships. He's about the Yankees. Eighteen years as a Yankee. There it is. And uh, you know, he just, you know, doesn't know what's, what to do. He needs help. So he, he comes home to Carmen. He goes to bed. Of course, the magic of theater. He has a dream. It calls in all of these Yankee greats to say, what is it about being a Yankee? Why did we win 27 championships? Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig didn't necessarily get along. Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle had their friction from time yeah, to time. Yeah, DiMaggio was not that gracious, let's just say, no. when Mickey came in as a young guy. Go ahead. Exactly. Um, and then you also have Derek Jeter as well, you know, who also had the benefit of four championships in five years in the late 90s up to 2000. So he brings them all together in the dream to really talk about this, you know, we are all, you know, great players. We all have strong personalities, but we all have to come together on the field to be a great team. And so that's the story we want to sort of tell. You know, I'm thinking about this because I said in the beginning that it wasn't, it isn't really just for baseball fans, right? Say someone isn't into the Yankees, which, you know, that's hard for me to believe. Say they're a Met fan. <laughs> Is it for someone who is a Met fan? 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know, really, this is about relationships, and we all can relate to that. How these men interact, how they focus up on the game, how they are on the field, how they are off the field, and how they are with each other, and, and we all have that. And really, when we took a look at the Yankees and why are they the greatest team, why have they won the most championships, perhaps because they function like a family. Sometimes a, a, a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family, well, I was going to say. We all have them, but when it comes down to it, on the field, team. they step up. Right, they come through for each other, you know, and that's so, what's exciting. I'm sorry for interrupting. It's so interesting because I think about Thurman Munson, the great Thurman Munson, who we lost in, in that horrific plane crash. He wasn't easy to get along with. For people who really, you know, know something about the Yankees, or you listen to folks in the room, he wasn't all that easy. But he did have a way of making it clear that they were all in this thing together. They were really all in this thing together, and you had to sublimate, if you will, your ego the thing that you wanted to accomplish in order to accomplish something greater. And sometimes those were statistics that you had to, you know, put to the, the back burner. You know, no, am I missing something? No, here? you're absolutely right. And, you know, and we'd have to sort of take ourselves back to that time. Think about it. Reggie Jackson had just won three championships with the Oakland A's. Yeah, right. He was the man. He comes to the Yankees. They hadn't won in 15 years. So he's like, okay, I understand the Yankees, but what have you done lately? And they had gone into the World Series in 76, but they lost. So they still hadn't had a championship since 62. And so now, and Munson was promised by George Steinbrenner to be the highest paid Yankee. And all of a sudden he looked around and said, oh, that's not happening. And that's uh, Reggie being And Francois Baptiste just uh, unbelievable. You know, unbelievable. By the way, tell everyone who's who here. Uh, Francois Baptiste, the actor, is playing Reggie Jackson. And uh, Keith Nobbs in the cowboy hat and leather jacket is playing uh, uh, Billy, Martin. Billy Martin. Got it. Um, and so this is the first act where they br come together in the hotel room in Boston the morning after this incident where Yogi's trying to say, okay, we, we all have to come together or this thing's all going to explode. By the way, this is the morning after Billy pulled Reggie Jackson out of, he literally, in the middle of an inning, I and mean, this doesn't happen in baseball, he pulled him out of right field. And Reggie's like, wait a minute, you're pulling me out of a nationally broadcast game. You want me to walk, run, into the dugout. For those of you who don't realize how embarrassing it is, Reggie gets into the dugout. He's on the dugout steps. They're not even letting him in. He's on the steps, and Billy's right up against it. Billy was crazy in some ways. They're screaming and yelling at each other, and there was almost a physical confrontation, no? Yeah, there was almost a physical confrontation. And this first scene of the play is a fictional, me fictional meeting the next day in a Boston hotel room where Yogi's trying to bring them all together and address what happened. So you see how each of them feels. You don't need to know exactly what happened on the field. You That's can not learn about baseball. It and, right. That's not, and by the way, women, and by the way, I'm not saying women don't like baseball, but for, some, for a woman who says she's not into baseball, she's into relationships. Absolutely. And we've got Carmen Barra, which is such a wonderful vehicle for us to learn about the relationship between Yogi and Carmen. And really, the two of them usher, through, usher us through this whole evening. And because we were looking at the Yankees really as a family, Carmen and Yogi were an example of a family and a unit, and they are still such a beautiful unit to this day. I mean, you're a Jersey guy. You know, they are just, you know, a staple Actually, in your home, Jersey. Actually, same hometown in Montclair. Montclair. They're, they're just, they're just like this. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And that's not just media stuff. They are really together. Yep. You know, the other thing I'm thinking all the way back for people who, again, you don't have to be a Yankee fan. You don't have to be a baseball fan. But people who really understood the thing between Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris, 1961. What's so amazing is that during that whole year when both of them were chasing um, the baseball record, the home run record, they were roommates with each other. Mm -hmm. They had a close relationship with each other. They had a brotherhood, even though they're, they really conducted themselves, let's say, very differently off the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was not about baseball. No. No, it was about brotherhood, and it was about, you know, uh, the pressures of being a ball player and, and, the, and the pressures of competing like that. I mean, it's just, I don't think we realize what that means to get up there every day, to have to perform, to have... 30,000, 40,000. To 50, be booed. 000, to be booed. To be rejected. You know, what if we all had that <laughs> everyday life? And we probably do to some degree. Yeah. You know, it's just not as loud. Yeah. So, so, and then, you know, and of course, Mickey, who's probably was one of the most amazing natural athletes, but gets injured early in his career, you know, ends up having these complications, which I believe in that year, he sat out probably the last 25 or 30 That's right. games. So he know? could not hit home runs. So, Let me ask you, because this is, this is a series. This isn't the only sports related work that you've done. We had Dan Loria, 
actually sitting right here many, many months back, who starred in Lombardi, right? Let's put Lombardi in context. Lombardi is, uh, was a play about? The play was about leadership. And when we started the series... Vince Lombardi. Vince, Vince Lombardi. Lombardi. Vince, right. It was about Vince Lombardi, the life of Vince Lombardi, and really the life of a man who got people to do things that they didn't think they could do. Mm. And we, we imagineered this sports series at a time where we just came off the financial crash. It seemed like we all, you know, every day got a phone call from a friend, a relative, I've lost my job. And it, it just was such a difficult time. We thought, what do we want to put on stage? The theater is such a wonderful vehicle to explore the things that are going on around us. And so we wanted to start off with this great leadership. We heard the speeches of Vince Lombardi so wonderfully delivered by Dan Loria when we went to do the play. But it's not whether you fall down, it's how you pick yourself up off That's the ground. Right. And we started with that. When you talked about brotherhood, we then went on to do Magic Bird, which was about competition and rivalry. Do you step Larry on Larry some... Bird, excuse me, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson competing against each other, starting in college and then in the pros. Intense rivalry, but this very close Brotherhood. Yeah, and, and before all of the technology and 24-hour yeah. news, they would literally get the paper and look at the box score and see what the other one did. I mean, they just kept driving each other, and then over time, then, of course, when Magic uh, announced that he had HIV, I believe, in 1991, I mean, Larry and, well, the whole community, the whole world was devastated. And if you watch the game that night that Larry Bird played, it's just, it's magical, literally, and how he gave honor to his his friend Magic. He loved Johnson. Magic Johnson. He really did. He still does. Well, well and and I know you. I'm just, sorry. No. Talk no, about opening night. You know, the most breathtaking thing happened opening night, which if you were, only if you were there, you could have seen it, but there was a curtain call, and the two gentlemen got on stage with the cast, and oh, Magic. Oh, hold on. Magic Johnson. And Larry Bird got on stage? Yeah. They got on stage with the cast at the curtain call opening night. And Magic started to, to, when the applause died down, Magic started to talk about their relationship. And he got choked up and he started to cry. And Larry, who is anyone who knows about him, <laughs> to, to, pretty removed. Yeah, he won't give it up. And, stepped forward and completely took over for him and told the story of how they met and what how they had this fierce competition and how it developed into this friendship and this real love. And in that moment, he was taking care of Magic Johnson. And it was, I mean, I'm getting teary just thinking about it. It was just, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. That's not about basketball, is it? No. 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 And that's, you know, going back to you don't have to be a baseball fan, you don't have to be a Yankee fan. When people came to see Lombardi, you know, we had women, we had men say, you know, particularly women say, I did, I've heard Vince Lombardi's name. I had no idea what he really did. I don't really like football, but I love the story it told. Um, and, and Dan Loria would say, you know, if people walked out of the theater saying, that triggered me to think a little differently about my life, then we did a good job. And that's really what we try to do in all these, this work. You know, I'll tell you, when we uh, started doing one-on-one -on -one from right here in, in Lincoln Center, one of the great things when we started it and when it continues to be a great thing is that you bring people in from the theater community who are doing this kind of work, who are moving people to think about the world and think about themselves in the world in a very special way. And um, I don't want to thank you for being a part of that discussion. So do you mind if I plug again? Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> the Bronx Bombers is being seen at uh, Circle in the Square Theater on uh, West 50th Street. Open January 10th. Uh, this show will be seen and before and after. I want to thank both of you uh, for coming in. Fran and Tony, wish you nothing but the best. Thank you very thank much. You. And give Dan Laurie your best. We will. We will. Guests, okay? okay? Great stuff. Stay tuned from the Tisch WNET studios right here in the heart of Lincoln Center. I'll be right back right after this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Anthony Lechura is an actor on the uh, hit HBO series Boardwalk Empire. I hated to see him go the way he went because we needed you, but you've got so many great things going on. i got to tell you something. You were the best. You are the best. You helped make that series so special. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm fawning all over you. We shouldn't do that. No, do it. <laughs> How great. I didn't want to go either. <laughs> you, how great experience has this been for you? So spectacular. You know, when all this first happened, Steve uh, Buscemi said, well, you know, it has given you, uh, you know, it's helped your profile. And I said, what do you mean helped my profile? <laughs> it gave me a profile as a screen actor.
I had a profile as an opera singer because that's where I came before that. For a lot of years. By the way, we should let people know you play Eddie. Eddie Kessel. Uh, who in real life is Lou Kessel. Lou Kessel, who was, in fact, Nucky Johnson, who was Nucky Thompson, right? They who, changed the names. They to changed the name to protect the innocent, the innocent and the guilty. Um, <laughs> Stephen Buscemi plays Nucky Thompson. You are his confidant and... His uh, man about town. No, his... Uh, Jack of all trades, his uh, his man Friday, and toward everything. The... Uh, not his attorney, but certainly his uh, uh, oh God, his chauffeur, his butler, his secretary, his masseuse. He cut, cuts his hair. His barber, uh, and uh, and toward uh, a later part, well, let's just started, say you wanted to do more. He wanted to do a little bit more, so he gave him some money to make a delivery. And you hung out with Al Capone's brother. And I hung out with Ralphie. Al That's Ralph. what I'm gonna say. Nice guy. And by the way, if you haven't seen the series, go back, do what you have to do, see this guy, because I'm not gonna tell you too much. Let's go to a clip from Boardwalk Empire. Watch this guy, he's the best. I will clean it. It's not important. It is important to me. It's only coffee. Everything is only something. I have no idea what that means. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie! C could you please? I. Thank you. It is overcooked. It's fine. No, it is not. Might be a little hard. It is inedible. If that's what you think, why did you serve it? Oh, my God. <laughs> First of all, you got, you got to talk about the German accent, because I know your family's from Italy, yes. um, otherwise known as Sicily, which some <laughs> argue may not. I'm sorry, I had to she, do that. I, know you, I, I, was I had to do that. I knew you were going to do that. Only someone <laughs> whose family's from <laughs> southern Italy can say that to someone who's from some, Sicily. Yes, exactly. Even like further south. Even further south. A little yeah, inside. Also. I'm sorry, a little inside <laughs> Italian stuff. But that being said, where did you pick up, I have to do it with my hands, Yes. where did you pick up this German accent? Singing at the Met and being with uh, as an opera singer as an opera singer for 27 years and before that on the road 20 and always working with uh, uh, European people, I had an ear for the languages. So uh, then uh, they sent a language coach, but also my wife's uh, gynecologist is our close friend and he's from Dusseldorf and we've become very very close friends with the family, and he had an accent with something of, of that nature. So it was not a hard German accent, but it was very, it was very comfortable and, and, and somewhat soft, not as opposed to something of this nature, but it was a soft German accent. So I chose to do the softer of the German accents. I did ask Marty, I said... Oh, excuse me, you just can't do that. Oh, what? You don't just say Marty like oh, that I, excuse me, television. Mr. Scorsese. Don't, 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 Mr. don't do that. Mr. Scorsese. Mr. Scorsese. <laughs> so when you, when you, when you did this, Audition for Martin Scorsese. Yes. We say the full name here. We say the full name. On PBS. One, on one on one. PBS. Yes, yes. Who, by the way, if you can get him to do the show, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been asking for 10 years. So when you did it for Marty, yes. he says... No, don't do a heavy Yiddish accent. Lou had a heavy Yiddish accent. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah, they were, yes. Lou, Lou Kessel, Kessel the right. guy that was based right. on. Of course, also, Lou was my height but 260 pounds. He was a bone crusher. Oh, he, the yeah. re, in the real life, the real life. of so Nucky Johnson's, Johnson's guy, he was physical, he was a, not you. Matter of fact, he was called the Turk. He was a wrestler in Austria. And I, th I don't know if he did any in America, but he was a bouncer. He did all kinds of things until he got work for, with uh, Nucky. So, so Scorsese got you to tweak? Yeah, he just said, no, let's, not go. let's just do a generic in a sense. Uh, German accent. So I went back to all the Germans that I worked with and of course going to Carl, uh, my good friend, uh, right. when I needed something, you know, a little bit more translation or how a sentence should have. They always sent someone on the set, always, which was great because I always asked for that. Mm. Just in case, you never know, you have a little, you, you have a, 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 a senior moment or you all of a sudden, you know how it sounds in your ear, but really, is it that way? And so it's nice to have someone on set to be able to say, boom. Describe your relationship, um, because on camera, it is extraordinary, the interaction between you and Stephen Buscemi. Describe it. There was a, an energy between us from the very first day of the pilot of the read at the table. 
by the way, the clothes are fabulous, but that's another story. Yes, Go aren't ahead. they? Anyway, but we just were so, uh, we just hit it off, and then after a while, you start to get, uh, you understand what the other person's doing before he does it, and those kind of, and we both did those kind of things. He's a very generous actor. Describe that for those of us who are ah, not I'll actors. T perfect. In the pilot, when he was trying to get uh, uh, Lucy Danzinger out of the bathroom, it was not written anywhere where he calls Eddie to come into the scene to help him. So I'm just standing there, and he says, Eddie, Eddie, come over here and get her out of here. So I go, and that was all ad lib. You must come out, Mrs. Miss Danziger. You must come this. out now. Well, that, he brought me into the scene. Marty loved it, and it stayed. That but that's the kind His of ego not involved in no. this. It's <laughs> not about him. It's not about him. It's about... It's just about what we're doing at the time. But that's with all of the, not just his, his right-hand guy, but with everyone he works with. He would be doing scenes where I would say, I just, it's not happening. He said, we're going to do it again. Don't worry about it. So when we were running lines, filming, mm -hmm. he'd say, right, we, Anthony wants to do it again. We do it again. We do it again. Till it was so spectacular. You know, it's easy to die. It's easy oh. and for the end, end of episode three. That is very Should tender. we tell people? Uh, oh, we better not. No, I don't not die at the end. But those scenes no. are very, uh, those are pretty easy. But when you're just looking at someone's eyes, speaking to them, trying to exp express what you feel from the inside, forgetting that right now <clears throat> we're down from the Met or we're down, we're, we're, we're on Broadway. Forgetting all of those things and just me focusing in right on you to tell you for what's in my soul, what's in my heart. Those are difficult things. That's really, you have to you just erase everything around the periphery and you're just looking at that person. And this is your first television. Yes. Compare that to all those years, 27 at years the Met, at yeah. the Met as an opera singer. Biggest differences, similarities? Uh, well, the obvious difference is you don't have to sing anything. <laughs> So you are uh, regulating. Ah, yes. Come on. Yeah, Torando. I was Torando. Oh, yeah, I was Torando. My mother every Saturday. Ah, look, Spoletta, Tosca, oh. the villain, the henchman. Look oh, at you. Look at oh, Bardolfo. See that nose? Yes. I saw that nose on a man in the subway. <laughs> because they said no man has a nose like that. I said, oh yes, they do. We put two rubber prosthetic noses, plus we put um, uh, latex plus oatmeal. Oh, Nick the bartender, La Fanchula del West, the girl of the girl. I just directed that matter of fact. All character Nazis. roles. All ca oh yeah, all character roles. Okay. People say, well, how uh, how did this? Uh, you know, <clears throat> you've been doing all these things at the Met in order to get to uh, Boardwalk Empire because it was all character. Right. I've always been second banana, and I've enjoyed it tremendously. Whoa, whoa, whoa why? Second banana, you enjoyed it, you don't want to be the lead guy. No. I, I, years ago at the Met, there was another singer, and we were the same age, and he did the leading roles. And I went up to the photography studio, and he wanted to get pictures, and I looked at his pictures, and they all look alike, except a different costume, but they all, you saw those pictures. They're all different. They're all different. It doesn't mean you have to have less voice. It means, as a matter of fact, you have to have more voice. And you have to have a lot of study because I have to learn your role mm. as well as mine so that I know how to fit in another language. So it's kind of wild. This you don't have to, well, you don't have to worry so much unless you're doing an accent and you're supposed to be German. <laughs> but it's so certainly you, not like singing. What it, an incredibly know. diverse career you've had. Oh, it's been wild. And, so, and by the way, I hate to do this, but I, I need to ask you, you're doing something after, we just heard before I was walking in the studio, House of Connolly, what's going on? Yes, this is a play, House of Connolly, that's going to take place at the, uh, <clears throat> it opens January 23rd right. to uh, February 9th. Young cast, this play hasn't been done. It was the group theater 80 years ago. It's being revived after 80 years with the original ending, which is so shocking. It's a play about the South and how this particular House of Connolly really doesn't want to let the new generation in. You do not have a southern accent. I most certainly do, sir. I play Uncle Bob. Now, Uncle Bob is an aristocratic gentleman. He is around 65 years old, you understand. And he, of course, lives in the house of Connolly. 
and he uh, is somewhat, he enjoys drinking. He feels that to, on occasion, one must drink. And it seems to me that waking up would be a wonderful occasion for us to have a little bit. Don't you think so, sir? I believe that. Of course, he loves young ladies. Of course. Isn't that interesting? How, how, how can how, that be? No, how do you do this? I, well, we were talking before about your background. Even though I'm from New Orleans, which has no accent like that. I grew up with people in Port Sulphur, and Port Sulphur people, one gentleman, uh, uh, Leander H. Perez, who was a big politician, and, and that's how he, come over here, Anthony. I want to show you something. <laughs> Do you enjoy bourbon? I'm only 15. Well, that's when you're supposed to sort. Come over here, have a bourbon with you, Leander. You must have a hell of an ear. It works. <laughs> you just, you <laughs> and then you just, stuff comes back to you and you... Yeah, wow. it does. It works. You love what you do? I love what I do. I love waking up. What's up with that? Seriously. Seriously? I'll yeah, be, I'm, I'm being I'll, serious. My whole life has been a gift. It truly, truly has. Everything. It's just, I was gifted with a great voice and things opened up for me. I... Uh, uh, I, I finished a great career as a singer, taught in New Jersey for a while, New Jersey City University, and then I get a call to do Boardwalk Empire, where you think you've retired from singing as an opera, so you're going to direct. I direct. I direct operas and teach. And then all of a sudden, an entire new career, then I was 58 or 59, at that age, wow. when that young lady called me and said, you're Eddie Kessler. I cried. I said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't mean, but this is a miracle. Yeah. Nobody can tell me that's not a miracle. That's a miracle. Yeah. And your friend Marty. He's a miracle. <laughs> He's a walking library. This Listen, man is a genius. We got to get out of here. I, I am, I'm a bigger oh. fan today than I was before. Oh, Thank you. Whoa, I'm honored God to bless you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Cone Resnick, and by PSENG. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by Celgene. We can see it. This day has never been closer. Today, thanks to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, hundreds of thousands with blood cancer are living a normal life. We're almost there. We're making cures happen. Join us.